In this video, I'm going to walk through solutions to problem set 3 from Math 207 Discrete Math at Hood College. All right, so I think a lot of you folks were struggling to really interpret a lot of our set theory notation. So let's start by visualizing what these sets AK and BK actually look like. So for our sets AK, in general, um, a good way to picture these guys is um, just visualizing them on a number line. So for A, Um, this will be the set of all fractions. So as a reminder, Q is the set of all rationals or fractions, P over Q, so that um, both P and Q are integers and Q is non-zero. So we don't include our endpoints. So A1 is going to go from zero up to, to one, uh, non-inclusive. Uh, A2 is going to go from zero to a half, a3 is going to go from 0 to a third, etc. And so as a reminder, um, the union of sets consists of any element that's in any. And looking at this pretty carefully, we can see that because A1 contains A2, and A2 contains A3, and so on, the union of these sets, so all this means is take the union of infinitely many sets that are getting smaller and smaller and smaller, the union should literally just be our first set. So this is actually going to be a nice property that any time if A is a superset of B, um, the union of A and B will return the larger set. So we can rewrite this as either it is just going to be A1, or we could write it as the open interval from 0 to 1, um, with the assumption that we're only talking about, only considering uh, fractions. So our universe of numbers that we're looking at are going to be ra uh, rationals or fractions. Uh, for set B, where B is going to be the union of sets that are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, so B1 is actually exactly the same set kind of by coincidence or design, as A1. So from 0 to 1 is our B. I'm actually going to make him a little smaller. Um, since our Bs are going to be increasing, our B2, looking at this, we're going to be taking all of the rationals between 0 and 2. So our second B looks like the, the interval from 0 to 2. Our third B is now the open interval from 0 to 3, and so on. So this time when I'm taking a union, um, I actually don't have a set that's, you know, some finite set that's going to contain the union of these guys. In practice, for any finite K, there's going to be um, one of our BKs that contains it, and so we could see that any positive fr fraction is going to wind up somewhere in here. So our union of these bi's is going to um, actually be an infinite set. I guess they're all infinite sets, but it'll be a set with which doesn't include zero, since zero is not going to be in any of the finite sets, but it goes all the way up to infinity, since eventually every positive rational number will be in one of these sets. I think a harder one for students to see, and one that I, a bunch of students come to chat with me about, was the intersection of these AIs. So in practice, um, for us to figure out what has to be in every set, we know that zero is not in there because it's not in any of our AIs. So zero isn't going to be in the union. But if there was some number in there, it would have to be a positive number, you know, at least between zero and one. But unfortunately, for any positive x, we can find some, uh, find a really big n, potentially, such that one over n is smaller than x. 
And so eventually, what that means is that this x couldn't be inside the set um, the set Bn, so it can't be inside our union. And so with this, we can see that our intersection, because zero is not in there and no positive number is in there, there's nothing in there. Uh, finally, for the intersection, we can actually look up here at our bi's, so I'll move this down. We see that since b1 is a subset of b2, is a subset of b3, and so on, all the way up, um, in general, we can use the property that if A is a subset of B, then the intersection of A and B is also A. And so we see that using this chain of subsets, we note that the only thing that's in all of them is going to be elements that are inside set 1. So again, our intersection of these sets is just the interval from 0 to 1. All right, at this point I'm going to jump to problem 5, since this is the next problem most students were asking me about. So in general, this is going to be a problem where we're going to use the multiplication principle um, and try to make as many independent choices as we can um, before we're constrained. And so for this one, we're going to start by trying to um, uh, like just list how many different ways we can write an 8-bit number. So as a, a bit is just a single digit of zeros or ones. And so for our 8-bit number, um, if we can have each single character um, represented by two choices of zeros or ones, the multiplication principle says that we can select all eight of these independently, giving us two to the eighth possible bits, or two to the eighth, um, uh, like two to the eighth uh, possible 8-bit numbers. So 2 to the 8th, or 256, is going to be all of our possible characters. Um, now, if we start looking at restricted bit patterns, so things where instead of having every possible choice available to us, for a palindromic number, that's something where a number like 0, 1, 1, 0, um, followed by 0, 1, 1, 0, or 1, 0, 1, 0, a palindromic number essentially repeats your first four digits in reverse. And so each of our digits is going to be paired up with a digit on the left. So in terms of counting how many free choices we're allowed to make, we can just note that this exact pattern of matching up left and right is going to tell us what our restrictions are. Namely, after I specify a character here, it forces a specific character here. So our two independent choices only give us one choice left on this side. Um, similarly, if I put a number here, I only have one choice. So my two bit choices on the left turn into only one choice on the right. Once I make my third choice, I have a single choice for my third from last digit. And finally, if I make my um, fourth choice, that constrains what bit goes here. And so the number of palindromic numbers um, of length 8 is going to be 2 to the 4th, or 16. Uh, finally, if we're asking how many different patterns have an even number of 1s, this one, we have to figure out how many choices we can make before we, like, wind up having restricted choices. So in general, if I just started putting down any random number I want, so that was a seven-digit random number, random-ish, <laughs> um, because I need an even number of ones, and I've already, I have an even number of ones in my, like, left seven digits, on, for this final digit, I'm going to put a zero. Um, similarly, if I had one, two, three. If I had, uh, let's make another zero there. If I had three ones and five zeros, then my final digit, so that I have an even number of ones, has to be a one. So in this part, didn't really want to insert a text box, but uh, in this part,
we have a constrained choice given by our seven independent choices here. So we have two to the seventh possible choices for our first seven bits, or 128 initial bits, followed by this final bit is entirely determined by the first seven. If I have an even number, it'll have to be a zero. If I have an odd number of ones, it'll have to be a one. Um, so this is called a parity check bit where we can actually verify, um, or we add this parity check bit as padding to guarantee that our numbers have an even number of ones. All right, so another problem that students asked me about was problem eight. And so there are actually a couple of different ways to picture this. So one that I really like is just a reminder of what, uh, what this notation means. So in general, if you ever have you know, the notation a set squared, all that means is that's the Cartesian product of the set with itself. So a set squared, and the first power of a set, is the set of all pairs so that the first and the second entries are both inside A. And so we'd like to look at specifically the ones in here where the first and the second coordinates are different. So one picture of this is we can imagine our, um, our overall 16 elements in this um, in this product of a set with itself, as this is the set of all ordered pairs um, indexed by the first and the second element. So for example, we have a 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, uh, 2, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3, and 2, 4. Uh, 3, 1, 3, 2, 3, 3, and 3, 4, and 4, 1, 4, 2, 4, 3, 4, 4. So that's the set of all of our elements. Um, the set we're interested in, we want to get rid of exactly the ones that have a first and a second coordinates that's identical. And so out of our set, um, one way to count this is just to note that we had um, four squared total elements inside this Cartesian product, and we had four elements along the diagonal. So with this, we get 12. Another nice way to think about this is think about how many choices we have at each stage. So instead of picturing all possible elements, so this, this type of argument is called an overcounting argument where we actually removed some number of elements. Um, alternately, we could picture how many choices I have independently for my first. So I have four for this first coordinate. Um, uh, times, I have three elements left I haven't chosen. So once I pick one of these rows, I know that I have three remaining choices. So the other way to get to this count is using um, the multiplication principle very carefully making note of how many choices I have left over. Um, in general, like we could use that kind of box style argument for an n by n box. So if I had my set contained n elements, then my Cartesian product of the set with itself, um, there are n squared total elements inside that set and I want to get rid of exactly the elements along the diagonal. And you'll note that there's exactly one of them in every row. So I have n squared minus n total choices. Um, alternately, again, picturing this representation of our ordered pairs, if we had n elements in our set, we have n choices for our first and n minus 1 for our second. So note these answers are equivalent, but they're just two different ways of thinking about this problem. Um, in general, if we have a set of um, cardinality n and we're making m tuple, so all it, a two tuple would just be something with coordinates a1 and a2. A three tuple would be something with coordinates a1, a2, and a3. And in general, the, this idea of tuples is just a, an ordered list 
with M elements in it. And so if I need every coordinate to be different, all I know is that I have M choices I'm making. I have N choices for my first, N minus one for my second, all the way down to um, N minus M uh, plus one. So you'll note that if we, if the first element we we're subtracting zero, second element we're subtracting one, all the way down to you know the nth element we're subtracting m minus one, which becomes m plus one. Um, alternately, we could write this as n factorial divided by um, n minus m factorial. Um, but this is only going to hold if there are more um, choices for me to make or at least as many choices as there are um, elements in my tuple. So this works then. However, if we think about it, imagine your set was one, two, three. If I asked you to try to make four tuples with four distinct choices, we run out of space. So we only have three choices for our first, then two, then one, then none. So there are zero ways to do this. If m is bigger than n. And so these are going to be our, our distinctions. So long as we have enough elements in our set, the number of m tuples is just the product of n all the way down to n minus m plus 1. But if m is bigger than n, there's no way for us to do it.